What's going on everyone? Thomas Jordan here for another episode. Today we are joined by actress and speaker Deborah Stipe. How's it going? It is going fantastic, Thomas. I'm so happy to be here. I'm super stoked as well. You're a returning guest. So I just want to know how you got started in the entertainment industry. You know, many years ago, we won't say exactly how many, although it is on Wikipedia. So <laughs> right? um, I grew up in a family of seven kids. And so I was kind of the ringleader of let's put on a show. I was a um, producer, director, but I did just kind of love to perform. And so I would rally my four sisters and my two brothers and we would just like do skits. It was like our own little SNL in the neighborhood. And uh, th really, that's how I started. And then when I got into high school, I did all the plays and all the musicals and went on to major in it in college. And it's so funny you talk about doing skits when you were growing up and you see people doing the exact same thing now with their phones. It's like, how is it looking? Is Do you get like flashbacks looking at it? It's like, we used to do that too. Well, I like literally we had this whole storyline. We created like, it was, I lived where it was cold. So we created this igloo in the front yard. And there was a whole storyline of like somebody sneaking into the igloo. And then my brother was like this old woman and we were the robbers and we had a whole storyline. <laughs> But we just had a little like a camera. So we would like literally take pictures, but there was no video. I, it, honestly, it's probably good that we didn't have phones because we might not have passed our classes because we were so. <laughs> yeah, but just in, I, I talked to a lot of content creators about that, like um, as far as like just whether you're just doing it for an entertainment or you're doing it for education or you're trying to build a business. It's so funny because I think a lot of people get caught up in the gear and it's like it sounds like you just kind of used what you had at the time even though there was no video but now it's on our phones which is just it's insane and a lot of people just use their phone because i think once again people get caught up in all this expensive stuff that honestly you don't really need no i agree what's funny is i have a really nice sony camera now and I'd, I'd still use it, but for my auditions, and even if I'm auditioning, like filming another actor, I'll use my phone because they're so good. They're so easy to use, so easy to edit and send it off. So there you go. Yeah. And when you, is it interesting now? Because I know when you're having to go to, you used to have to go to an audition and now it's all done online. You can do it with your phone. When's the last time you actually stepped in an audition room? Okay, that's a really good question. I did have a callback for a film maybe okay. two and a half months ago. Okay. And honestly, it was really, really fun to like be there live. Thank you. Um, but it reminded me of living in LA because that's what I always did. Uh, I mean, literally, not only would you have to go to the audition live, you'd have to pick up your script from the studio. You'd have to have permission to get on the studio lot, to get the script, to then drive home, to then show up in person the following day. I mean, it was it was exhausting. But the advantage was that you're in the room. Like when I had my call back, I'm in the room with five of, you know, the director, the casting director, you know, the team, and they're there to give me direction. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot to be said for being in the room and having that, you know, real connection. Yeah, it's so interesting. I got into it a little uh, later in the game where I was driving around LA, even trying to find parking near like, you know, the five or six audition areas. And like one was up the street. I was like memorizing my sides and my lines on the way to the audition. But yeah, now it is completely changed. Like they'll email it to you. You can do a thousand takes. But I do have a selfish question though. I... I once saw an interview with Ryan Seacrest and he obviously got his, he's very famous for American Idol and they were talking about how he got that gig because there was about three, at least 3,000 hosts. I mean, you're talking people from TV, radio. I mean, it is a stroke of luck if you even get in the room, but he goes, yeah, I'm a bad auditioner. And then he just wanted, but he's like, somehow I did something or other and got it. And I'm thinking to myself, bad auditioner. I was like, if you've, if you're bad at auditioning, you're not going to get the gig. So do you, I mean, is that possible to still get good gigs, even though you are a quote unquote bad auditioner? Is that a thing? You know, there's no real magic formula for making it in this industry. 
sometimes it's because people really, really like you. Sometimes it's because you have a lot of natural charisma. And so maybe that covers, I heard recently that there needs, you need to have three things now. Okay. Mm. Number one, you do have to have a semblance of tag talent. You have to have, you have to be able to deliver the lines. Secondly, you have to have a following. Like they want you to have people want, you have to be willing to, you have to be able to bring in money. Your name has to bring in some semblance of money. And then third, you have to be reliable. Mm -hmm. Which is always odd to me. Cause like, that's always like, I feel like that is almost like a no brainer. You got to be reliable, but you hear crazy stories all the time about people on set taking, you know, X amount of time longer to get on to set or something. I just, I'll never understand that part of, I have a small theory and tell me if I'm off, but if like, let's just say a list celebrity, a is known for not showing up on time and then it's in the press and then, you know, he or she gets raked through the coals. Is that the industry's like, I almost want to say like a little bit of promotion, you know what I mean? Like a little bit of PR to generate buzz, you know, like when Christian Bale, there was that leaked audio tape of him yelling at the lighting guy for messing up his scene. And I'm sitting there thinking, I was like, man, what a jerk. But then I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> you know, they are Jenna gen- because Hollywood's a machine. So I'm curious on your take on that. I think you could be, there could be something to that. I think too, unfortunately there's, there's a sort of mystique about successful actors and if they're angsty and if they're, do you know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. if they're irresponsible, we almost give them a pass sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I am a firm believer that your reputation goes with you. Like mm-hmm. you die with your reputation, you know? And so even if you've, even if you've made it, who wants to be known for the guy that's, not on time or not prepared or, you know, or not kind. <laughs> yeah. And working, I mean, you see it too. And that's the thing. It's like, who would want to, but there are people who have had like lavish careers and they have a track record of just being a nightmare to work with. So it's just, and I always wonder, like, is, you know, having a broadcasting background, it's like, there's always three sides to a story, his side, her side, and what really happened. And I'm always curious to know if it's that person as a person, or is it the Hollywood machine at work? And it's just, you hear so many stories and it's just, uh, you just, I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've got, I've got names on up. names that I'm not going to yeah, throw them under the bus, it. but yeah. Yeah. But it happens. I mean, in, I think it was hello, darling. Shia Buff was mm-hmm. sort of released. Do we really know what happened there? Um, we don't. Not for me to know. Yeah. But I do think that your reputation can catch up with you. So why yeah. not? I wish I had the connections and the budget to do a project like that because I'm telling I have a million questions for Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> I've watched <laughs> so many interviews and people are like, he's crazy. I'm like, is he though? It's just, ah, I don't know. It's more sane than the rest of us. I don't know. Yeah. But you did say though, they're looking for P you know, the industry is looking for people with, uh, followings now. Um, do you think that, I mean, does it have to be a big following or is it something where it's like, you know, 10,000 or less, or are they looking for somebody who can like really bring in the numbers? I think it really depends on the project. Like there are people that are reality stars that aren't actors that have been cast in big roles. We hear about it, right? Mm-hmm. I think it really depends too, like on the creative team. Some creative teams care a lot and they really need that person who's got a huge following. They know they're bringing their fan base. I think other times it's simply, um, if I'm going to cast you in my project, I'm going to see your audition. I also might look you up on Instagram just to get a fuller sense of who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think there's also that. Uh, something to be said for it. it gives you a window into who a person is and what they enjoy. And so I, I think there's that too. How do we really know how big our following needs to be? I don't know. Yeah. It was always like a question. Like you just don't know because I mean, thing numbers are so easy to manipulate. You just, how do you know which ones re- are real and how much is fake? Right. And I mean, I get, asked all the time, I'm sure you do, DM'd all the time, 
we'll get you more followers, we'll get you more, you you know, you'll pay this and this. And I don't know. I just feel like, you know what? I want to pay for it. I'm not going to. I'll I'll be honest that I I tell my clients as I was like, yay close to paying for followers and a blue check mark when I was in LA. And as soon as I did it, I paid the guy and I had immediate regret. And I was like, nope, nope. Called him back. I was like, dude, I changed my mind. Ain't not going to do it. I'm glad I didn't because everybody I worked with, that's the thing I know people with tens and thousands, if not hundreds and thousands and millions of followers who either, well, they're either fake and they don't make any money. So it's like you have this um, crazy following, but you can't sell 30 t-shirts for 20 bucks. So it's like, what do, what do, what are we doing here? Right, right. Something's off. Mm-hmm. But you can kind of usually tell like by the level of engagement that they have, like, are people responding or are are, how many comments are there, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and you do a great job on Instagram and ladies, and I know like I know you have some more like higher production stuff, but I know a lot of it is just your phone. Um, can you kind of do people, I guess when you go into the audition room or anything, do people ever bring up your Instagram or your social media at all? It's funny. So far they have not. Hmm. Now I must say that I audition this is funny. I auditioned for something and did book it. And she owns a boutique. Her name is Lillian Lee, super mm-hmm. fun character. And she is the star within the show, okay? Within the film, she is the star of Fashionista Housewives, which I think should be a thing, Thomas. <laughs> Would be a thing. What is that? It's Fash- made up. Oh. Fashionista Housewives is made up, but I think we should make it a reality. Huh. That's what I'm saying. But in this movie, I play Lillian Lee, who is the star of Fashionista Housewives. So anyways... <laughs> For the project, when I showed up, they had made these huge posters of the show using some of my Instagram posts. No, they asked permission. They asked. Have oh, that—that that was my next yeah. question. I was like, oh, but were they, they just like, oh, oh we're yeah. just going to so, screen oh, no, clip no, this? And no, 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 no. We we had already dialogued, but I didn't know that they were going to be like these amazing, like huge posters. Um, but all that to say is, I think when they went to my Instagram they realized even more, like I thought my audition was strong, but I think when they went to my Instagram, I think they realized, oh, she could play this. Does that make sense? Yeah. It, 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 clothing boutique. It Now that could work against me too. I sometimes have thought this in life. I'm a little bit larger than life. I love fashion. I like to talk to the camera. I like talking to you, Thomas, right? <laughs> um, I do. And I get on and I talk about our tree houses and I talk about, you know, or my dinner party, you know, whatever. I'll talk about my outfit. Um, but sometimes I'll audition for something that's really angsty, you know? And so then I think, does this work against me? Because there are, there are people that go and they watch a movie. And they see Tom Hardy. They see him in that movie. And they are totally bought in. Oh, my gosh, it's Tom Hardy and I'm in. It's not Tom Hardy, right? And then they go to Tom Hardy's Instagram and he's sitting there eating his Cheerios. I think there's a part of us, and I've heard directors say this, I I want somebody who's a no name because I want a blank slate for my audience. And our social media kind of prohibits that. Yeah. It's such a, it's like a quadruple, like there's no winning because it's like, it's like you either have like a huge following and you almost fall into that category of like, not reality star, but like that reality star, like influencer thing. But then it's like, okay, well, we want to know buddy, but then it's like, you run into stuff where it's like, well, you don't have a following. It's like, (laughs) you you can't, you can't win. It's either. Yeah. Like you said, the Tom Hardy thing is a great, uh, great analogy, but, and it's also weird. Cause like some like A-listers are hopping on like Kevin Bacon. It's like right. he can, he's just at a level now where it's like he can do whatever he wants. And I think that's what everyone wants to do. But depending on which business you're in, uh, it either prohibits, it either works for you or works against you. Yes. Yes. No, you're right. absolutely right. You got Reese Witherspoon doing it all and still getting great roles. Do you, under, I was going to say, <sighs> Yeah, I mean, is there, there really is no, 
there's, do you, is there an explanation for that? Or is it just kind of the luck of the draw or is it just, it just depends on the project? Uh, be more specific, I guess, like Reese Witherspoon, I think has gotten to a level where she can, she's out so entrepreneurial, mm-hmm. you know, so she's created her own production company that, uh, produces female writers books, right? That's cool. And some of those might have roles for her and some of them might not, but she's passionate about what she produces. That's awesome. It puts her in a position of power, Mm -hmm. which is great. Have you, uh, have you and your team ever thought about reaching out to her team or her production company to see if there's any projects that she's working on that you can work on as well? I, that would be a dream. I'm a big fan of those. Uh, and she's in Nashville. Come on. She's not that far away. Yeah. Funny is she has a niece who we cast in our kids show because she's an actress. And then there was a schedule conflict and I think it was COVID and we weren't able to utilize her, which was really a bummer. Hmm. But I thought it would really re- be fun to work with her and, uh, you know, maybe her aunt comes to the premiere, you know? Yeah. <laughs> It's like, you're just like looking for this, like you're either looking for like a blonde, you know, the blonde with the sunglasses or like somebody in a really bad wig. And maybe it's Reese Witherspoon just hanging out. (laughs) And it's always funny. I'd always want to, I'd, I'd love to ask her too. Cause I feel like, I don't know if you said it was Reese Witherspoon's cousin who was in it. It was her her niece. Her niece. Well, we did cast her, but then there was a schedule conflict. Yeah. Yeah. So would she technically be a product of nepotism because I spoke to Jeff Bridges one time on a red carpet and he's a product of nepotism. I can't remember exactly who, like I know his mother and father are really big in the industry, but I asked him, I was like, you know, if you're a product of nepotism, do the actors or your co-stars that you work with ever get mad at you because they're have they're not in the same game you are? Like you're just like, oh, I know somebody. Let me make a call, and then everybody else is in the mud. And he just kind of looks at me and he's like, you know, I never thought about that. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I was like, I would be so mad. I'd be so mad. But it's one of those things where it's like you can't. It's like not you can't hate the player. You got to hate the game. Like that's just how it goes. So right. I wonder, I wonder if she is a product of nepotism. Well, you know what? I follow her and I've talked to her mom and I know for a fact that she's doing on the regular, she may not be doing it anymore, but she was doing theater. She was mm. doing theater in Nashville on a regular basis. So I know this girl was training. So I think my personal opinion is, yes, there is nepotism in any industry, but at the end of the day, you want to be. You want to, you have to have the tools to bring to the game. Now I've been on sets where there has been nepotism and you realize that that actor maybe really wasn't prepared. And in that moment, I'm feeling for them. Now the director knows who he is the daughter of, but I feel for him because it's, he got the opportunity, but he wasn't all that prepared. And so it, he probably was struggling in that moment. And so what do you, say, take advantage of the nepotism, but be ready, right? Yeah, and what do you mean by not being prepared? Uh, he was he was overly nervous uh, because he hadn't done it very much. Yeah, you know. What he did, and he didn't study his lines or something, or did he just get so? Because I know that feeling where it's like it is just a down. It is like an avalanche of nerves. And once you go down here, it's like it goes quick and you start forgetting, you know, you forget your own name. Right. You know, it's one thing, you know, we see those bloopers, right, where uh, Zach Afron's forgetting his words and it's hilarious, right? But he's Zach and he's proved himself, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? When you're new, like especially like a lot of the actors I know, they're get, they're playing the guest star, the co-star. They're not the series regular. And so – the pressure's on, they feel it in a different level. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it happens and it's not a good feeling. Is it, is there a name for it? Is there like an industry like slang term for not being prepared or that feeling where it's like an avalanche of emotions where you just, it's almost like, oh my God, I'm failing like at 10,000 miles per hour. <laughs> I think it's a director's job to know. Like sometimes I've seen actors buckle 
And the director was like, come on, man, what's going on? Like, almost like he knew the actor well enough to know, why can't you focus? There's something going on. Almost like he was going to pull the actor aside because he was a series regular and it wasn't like him. Hmm. Right. But then I've seen actors that like literally just weren't prepared. Like they just hadn't done the homework. So what ha- like I I haven't been on set when that happens. What happens when that happens? I mean, you've got I mean it's you well, money would- money is being spent by the second when you're on set. So what happens when that happens? And I think people don't realize the pressure. The mm-hmm. pressure that is on a set. That's kind of one of the reasons why we were in a studio with my daughter and I, as you know, and that's one of the reasons we created our sitcom was that kids could feel the pressure of being on what was a set and having to deliver when the cameras and everybody was staring on, the lights are on and we're calling action and you got to be ready. Um, so I've seen it happen where, and it was a young actor on the series and he got through it, but I know they weren't going to bring him back and so I wasn't quite sure storyline if they were just going to decide to not have it be a recurring role or if they were going to try to figure out how to recast him not sure what they decided but I know it didn't go great so like what I mean but like do if they can't remember their lines or they didn't do if they didn't study their lines and everything like do they just move on I mean are they just like okay well this scene we got to film it you don't know your stuff well we're just going to move on or does he get he or she get time to go try and throw something together or how does that work? Usually they're not able to take that time. Um, But sometimes they might say, you know what, let's take a break. You know, let's take five and give the actor five. Um, I do know this was kind of so funny. So I was on full house. I was uh, Danny Tanner's girlfriend for three episodes. And so Mary Kate and Ashley were obviously Michelle's, the Michelle's, the two Mm -hmm. Michelle's. But they were so little. So we would film it before a live audience. We'd rehearse all week. And then it would be like live theater on Friday. It was so much fun. But they could do like one. I mean, and right, with all due respect, at this point in time, they're like five. They could do one line at a time, mm-hmm. pretty much. And so cameras would be rolling. And they would say the line. And then the director would say, great, say it again. And they would just get like maybe eight takes right in a row. Uh, So, I mean, we would stop the scene basically for them. Hmm. And you know what? It worked. And they would use the take that worked and they'd splice it in later. And then the rest of us adults would continue to like, you know, we would do it like a live audience. Yeah. Is there a lot of pressure when it comes to filming in front of a live audience? Like I always, you always hear it on like TGIF back in the day and it was like filmed in front of a live studio audience. And I always wondered if that was like for real or not. I mean, when I did full house, it was absolutely for real. There's a show here in Atlanta called Ms. Pat Hmm. absolutely filmed in front of a live audience. So, I mean, for me, I had done a lot of theater growing up, so I loved it. Because there really is an audience and they really are giving you feedback. And you know what? If, if if somebody does really mess up, we can go back. It's kind of the best of both worlds. You know what I mean? Like you have the the satisfaction of getting the laughs, but you also, if it, if something really goes awry, you can, you can stop and do it again. And with that pressure on, do you feel, and since you do have a theater background, do you feel like your performance level is just at like maximum level like do you like like do you get more oomph in knowing that there's people watching yes i probably do (laughs) i do because i think i'm kind of just a natural performer yeah and that's why i think that there is that sort of heightened sense of like excitement i think though one of the things i love about film though is you know if you're filming a scene where you're by yourself and your girlfriend just broke up with you and the cat is sick and you just lost your job. You know what I mean? All those things, Mm -hmm. right? And it's a really intimate private moment. There's something really special about a set because, and just the camera, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which the theater has a harder time. I think grabbing those moments. 
Yeah. I mean, and how do you, oh, go ahead. No, I just, I just think to, for me, that's the beauty of film is capturing those intimate moments. Do you, are you the type of actress where you have to stay in character the whole time and you can't be disturbed, whether it's like, you know, you have to do a hard scene or it's either, you know, super sad or depressing or whatever. Do you have to kind of stay in character and tell everybody to leave you alone? No, and I'm not one of those actors that's going to like stay in character all day on set. There there are those actors. And I think if you're doing something extremely demanding, like when Daniel Day-Lewis played Lincoln, like I guess he played, he was Lincoln all day long. Um, I've never done that. But there is something to be said for um, getting in the zone. I, I think every actor is different. Some can just do, you know, turn it on. But I recently did just something even for class and she had an accent she was an alcoholic. She was an addict. And you don't just pop into that. So, so yeah, I'm not going to sit in the corner for an hour, but I might sit in the corner for 10 minutes. I was going to say, how do you get in the zone regardless of what role you're playing? For me, what you know what I like to do is I speak as the character in her voice, if she has an accent, it's in the accent. She was Southern. Uh, but I just kind of, uh, I improvise. I improvise what she's thinking about. I improvise how much it sucks that I just found out I had cancer. You know, like I'm just improvising and I might be talking to somebody, I might be just talking to myself. Um, but I just speak in her voice and I think it's actually an important exercise. Like, we think of improv as like, it's funny, you know, and here's like, here's your cue and go. But there's a lot to be said for improv as you cultivate a character. Um, I like to use it because you think about it, if you really know a character, you don't just know their lines that are on the page. You know what they would say if, you know, if their kid just walked in the room or if their husband said, no, we're not going to dinner, you know how they'd react and what they might say. So if you're really fleshing out a character, you should be able to improvise. And how do you distinguish, like, when you're in the zone, your lines from what's actually happening? So everything kind of runs on autopilot when the camera turns on. Well, I mean, one thing that actors often do, especially in an audition, is they do something called a tag. So in an audition, I try to stick to the script as much as I possibly can. So the other day I'm auditioning, she's very kind of, type A, CEO kind of OCD woman. So I'm thinking about Jennifer Aniston from the morning show. So she's a professional who's achieved a certain level. And then also a friend of mine who's a psychologist. And she's always perfect, <laughs> um, always put together. But then at the end of the scene, there's a little bit of freedom. But in the scene, you really want to stick to the script. But at the beginning and the end of the scene, there's a little bit of leeway like where you can add a line or two. And it all depends on the director. Sometimes directors give you a lot of freedom. Or sometimes a, a director will say, give me two takes. The first take, stick very close to the script. And the second take, you can loosen up a little bit. Yeah, I... Uh... Like, like, like Owen Wilson, Ed Helms, these guys, like on Father Figures, Larry Sher was fantastic, and he would just let them play. When you have actors like that, why would you not let them play? Robin Williams, why would you not let him play? Right? Yeah, I just funnier than ours. So just yeah, my brain just never worked like that, though. Like I, I've seen you do it. I've seen your daughter do it, and my friend who's an actress out in L.A. She can just turn it on. I like because I used to film her auditions, and we would you know, be, we just got off of work and she's like, Hey, can you film this for me real quick? We'd been like cutting up all night. And then she just flipped into this mode like instantly. And I was just like blown away on how easy it was for her to just go from point A to point. I mean, she crushes commercials all the time. She's a great commercial actress and she's a good actress as well, but I could just, 
that's the thing. I, that's why I'm the interviewer. Like I just, I, I'm sure I could with a lot of work, but there's people who just snap into it. And I've noticed that you and your daughter have that ability to do it too. And I don't know if that's just years of training or it's just like, okay, time to go. And I just, even with like commercial stuff, I always found it very, very difficult to just not be myself at all times. It is just, it was very difficult for me. I don't know if you, if you personally run into that or, uh, you have clients that, uh, have that issue as well. Well, I think that honestly, there's some actors that would rather play a character than themselves and you Mm. play yourself really well. You know what I mean? And you Mm. get to be yourself as, as an interviewer Yeah. and red carpet or, you know, whatever it is you're doing. A lot of actors can't do what you do. So yeah, but they're the ones booking roles. <laughs> I'm, the one, I'm the one like, I'll do an audition. Like, you know, I had uh, an audition for, um, what was it, Better Than Bull Young or whatever. And you do your lines and whatever so many times you remember it or Popeyes or something. And then like I'm watching TV and I, I hear the lines and I was like, I don't even like the guy they picked. I was like, not even close. We didn't look alike. So it's like, I always wonder like why, I mean, either my audition was that bad or, but we looked nothing alike. It was some dude with like red curly hair and glasses. Like I have more of like an all American look. So I just don't know what they were. <laughs> don't we're know what they were doing, off. but it sucks because I'm like, dang it. I wanted that one. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. You really want them. And yeah. when you feel like you delivered, that's hard. Yeah. But I know, uh, I know the industry has changed quite a bit since the pandemic. I remember pre pandemic, I had like, five, it was so funny. Cause I wasn't, when I was in LA, I wasn't booking anything. I could bear like barely get my agent on the phone. But when I moved back to Atlanta, you know, that's where I met your daughter on set for the, um, food network and then floor and decor. I was like, Holy crap. Like, where have I been? (laughs) And I had like five, like solid hosting gigs lined up. I remember there was one, I was like, as a host, I always wanted to host, um, Comic-Con like as people, you just meet all sorts of cool people down there. And there was an audition for one in Portland, which was like, uh, we'll just call it like a minor league esque or like a Walmart version of Comic-Con in Portland. I was like, oh, this is so cool. And the, you know, our, my agent at the time was like, yeah, but the pay's not that good. I'm like, I don't care. Send me in there. I want it so bad. And then all of a sudden March, 2020 hit and it was just, and then everything changed. And when we talked the first time, uh, like, you know, I guess they were doing closed sets. Everyone had to get masked up and everything like that. And fast forward to now, are you seeing, are, are they kind of being, is the industry loosening its grip at all? Yes, absolutely. And I would say too, that there's even some actors that are being, becoming more and more outspoken about let's loosen up Yeah, certain industries that are more strict than others. Not quite sure I want to get into that or I don't Mm -hmm. really understand it necessarily, but, um, but SAG has been very strict and they want to protect the actors. I appreciate that. But I think they're, I think they're loosening up. That's yeah, that's good. Is And is yeah. it, and and how is it between, I guess, actors? Is it like, are, are some, is it kind of like a line drawn down the middle on set where it's like, we want, you know, we want to be safer than others, or is it just, is it kind of a, a, a mix of all traits or is everybody just kind of on the same page? You know what? I think it's a little bit left up to the person. Um, mm-hmm. I think actors, because we're made up, uh, and we're speaking, they do give us a little bit of more leeway, honestly, which is nice. Um, but I think it's only getting better and better. I recently did a Will Trent episode and not everybody was masked mm-hmm. and it was nice. I mean, I had to be tested before I showed up, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so I think every set is a little bit different, but there's pretty consistent rules with say, but I think, I think it's getting better. Awesome. And when do you think things will this is like the million dollar question, but like, when will things go back to normal quote unquote? 
I couldn't even guess. I couldn't guess. I mean, I think we're on a, I think we're on a right, the right path. I sure hope so. Yeah, me too. It's just like one, yeah, I think everyone wants to just get back to work and have one or two or three less things to worry about. And it's just like, let's just, let's just get back in this. Right. right. Well, it's funny. I mean, all of us are going to big events with, with, with thousands of people potentially mm-hmm. making our own decision of whether now I understand you want to, you know, there's nothing worse than like you've put the incredibly expensive schedule together for a film or a series and then somebody's sick. I mean, yeah. that's expensive. <laughs> it's inconvenient and very expensive. Yeah. Um, so I understand, but I, I sure hope we're making progress forward. Yeah, I uh, when I was doing news, uh, we used to do story I, every year. We do a story on the flu and flu shots, and it was always funny because I'd have to go into these doctors' office, and sure enough, they were packed to the gills, like people are coughing everywhere. And I'm like, "What?" And this is pre-pandemic, so I'm like walking through with all my camera gear. I'm like, "I eh, don't touch anything," you know. And I always ask the doctor, I was like, man, it's like, there's a thousand people out there who are coughing, seizing, like there are germs everywhere. People are contagious. It's like, how do you guys deal with it? And how do you guys not get sick? And he told me, he goes, don't touch your face ever. He's like, we touch so many things. Don't touch your face, wash your hands and use hand sanitizer. But I think like that all, and this was God, this is almost 10 years ago. And for whatever reason, that has always stuck with me. So anywhere I go, I'm like scratching my eye with like my palms or, or my uh, the back of my wrist or something, just trying not to touch my face. But I, I almost want to chalk that up to uh, that leading to my, I guess, bill of health, if, if we'll call it that. Yeah, well, good for you. Yeah. But I do, however, I do worry about getting on planes because I always, this is even before that anyway, I just feel like I've seen so many videos on TikTok of like how unclean planes are. It's crazy. I'll be out there with the, uh, the wipes, the disposable wipes, like wiping down everything. But yeah. Ignorance is bliss, but no, that's yeah. <laughs> well, Tim, I know you're working on a big uh, YouTube project right now. Uh, we started to talk about it off camera at the event we're at, but tell me, uh, how is that? I guess, I guess, how is this different than something that would be brought to you by, uh, a studio? Um, actually, um, we're probably not going to talk about this. One. Oh, okay. Not yet. We'll get that'll be on the next okay. interview. So we got so okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I I will say that I'm very excited about a film I've got coming out this spring. It's probably going to be premiering on Pure Flix, but I hope that it gets a bigger audience than that. It's called The Golden Influencer, and uh, what's kind of funny about it is the lead girl is from The Chosen. She's beautiful, lot of silver, but her best friend is played by Sarah Stipe, my daughter. So then, who's the manager of the little boutique that I own in the show? Sarah Stite. So long story short, we ended up being mother-daughter in the film, which is kind of fun. Um, but it's a fun, fun romantic comedy with kind of an inspirational faith-based undercurrent to it. Uh, so I think it's going to be really, this could be a, a joy. So, did you guys yeah. audition as a pair or did they find out and it was like they found out after the fact? We found out after the fact. No so, way. I'm not kidding. So we're both cast independently. And then they're going through the script. And then they realize we've got some scenes together. <laughs> and then they realize, shoot, do people think they look too much alike to not have them be mother daughter? And they decided, yes, they do look too much alike and have too many similar mannerisms. So they're just like, you know what? We're writing it in. They're going to be mother daughter. So that's I, insane. I know I that know is so cool. Sarah is the manager of the boutique. That is hilarious. So did you guys get the scripts and you're like, Hey, it's for the same thing, just different, you know, it's like, Oh, oh yeah. it's for the X project for this. And it's like, Oh yeah, I got the same. Then you guys just filmed your audition. Like she films you, you film her and then just go. That has happened. I mean, and, most of us are in, I'm kidding. Um, yeah. But we were both in father figures. 
So father figures with, I was Terry Bradshaw's wife. Mm -hmm. films, Owen Wilson are the leads in it, Glenn Close. And Sarah was in it as well. But we didn't have any scenes together. So this is the first time that we've been cast in something professionally that we literally are related mother-daughter in the same scene. And how cool is that watching, like, how cool is that for you as a mom to be cast with your daughter? I feel like that's got to be huge. Oh, it's huge. It's huge. I always tease her. See, my very first job, uh, well, it wasn't my first job, but my I had a job, her first job, excuse me. Sarah's first on-screen performance was right here. <laughs> I was doing a Murder, She Wrote episode with Angela Lansbury, and I was about three months pregnant. And uh, so that was Sarah's debut. Sort that of. it that is a, I hope you have a picture of that somewhere. I would total I would totally have a screen grab of that or you know how they're bringing back all these shows on Hulu or something you could easily take a screen grab and just like frame it right there. <laughs> but but uh did you I didn't know she was in Father Figures. Is she an extra or is she like in it in it? No, here's a really sad tale which every actor probably has one of these stories. She's cast hilarious scene. She's in the bathroom. She is the a uh, captain of a girls' field hockey team. Okay, so they're all in their plaid skirts and they got their field hockey sticks, and they have to go to it. They're in a bus because they're a traveling team. They're stopping at a rest stop. Okay, they go in the bathroom, and they hear a male's voice. It's Owen Wilson. Hmm. So Owen Wilson pretends that he's a girl, but it's on this girl voice. Anyways, the scene was hysterical. They shot it. And then, of course, they're upset. You know, the girls, the team is upset that this guy, Owen Wilson, is in the girls' bathroom. So they come chasing after him with their field hockey stick. Sarah's in the lead, and they're, like, viciously upset. You know, it's a very funny scene. It's in the trailer, Thomas. It's in the trailer. So she goes to watch the film, and they changed it. Oh, they cut the scene. Cut the scene. They changed it. I don't know if they thought of, I, I really don't know if they thought it was too inappropriate having the guy in the girl's bathroom. Hmm. So instead it's a little boy, which I, which is awkward too. Right? Yeah. It was very unfortunate, but she, hey, she stills the credit. She still crushed her audition. She still crushed her time on set with Owen Wilson and Ed Helms, but it just happens. Yeah. After these stories yeah but I, at the end of the day you still get paid i had a friend who paid, did, right yeah, yeah you still get the experience you get the credit and get paid even though you didn't make it i had a buddy who had like five lines in the second hunger games movie and he got flown out to germany for like two weeks and they had to like extend his stay so he was like getting his day rate and then some for like two weeks and set his five lines and didn't even make it in there. But like you said, he had the experience. He was like, yeah, hey, what'd you see? I was like, you still got paid, right? He's like, yeah. I'm like, all right. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you know. But um, as far as, and in working with bigger actors like Owen Wilson, Terry Bradshaw, Angela Lansbury, mm -hmm. is it, and Bob Saget, is it just, I don't know. Like, I feel like everybody goes through this no matter what industry you're in. Like, you know, you cut your teeth. Like we kind of talked about the guy who, you know, wasn't prepared and he's going to take that story with him the rest of his life, especially have, if he has a longer career and obviously you just build on top of that, but it's like you work with, you know, we'll just call them no name actors or just like, you know, C D list, we'll just call it. But then all of a sudden now you're working with somebody like Owen Wilson and Ed Helms and people who have like some serious oomph in the industry. Does that change like a mental or physical state of mind, I guess, when you're on screen with these people? I think that's why it's so important to stay in class, to hone your craft, and to just be amongst actors to some degree, because you don't want to show up feeling super intimidated. Now we all, like even celebrities probably have their celebrities that they would mm. be intimidated to work with. But you kind of just sort of get that out of your system and then like get to work. Yeah. And you also have to remember, you know, I'm talking to Ed Helms. He went to high school. In in mid yeah. You know, Midtown or something like yeah. that. Yeah. And so like he did theater in high school, you know, so John Stamos, the same. So these are like regular people that just are talented and have worked hard and got some really nice breaks. 
Huh. You have to keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't even, I just, man, it, it takes me, it's even interviewing celebrities. It took me a hand, like a handful of them to just like get, you know, cause at the end of the day, they're all the same anyway, but it's just it for that first like handful I was just, you know, like deer in headlights, like, oh man, it's Gordon Ramsay, who, by the way, is the nicest person ever. I was so ready for him to just jump down my throat. Nicest dude ever. And went on to tell me that, like, you know, I was like, do you ever get tired of, uh, you know, yelling all the time? He's like, no, mate. He's like, I actually yell at the parents more. He's on like Master Chef Juniors or something. And I'm like, really? Oh, that's cool. But yeah, just super nice guy. But, um, Deborah, I, like I said, I could ask you questions all the time. Um, so just to kind of wrap it up a little bit, I want you to tell us a little bit, some of the projects you're working on and the products and services that you offer as well. Yeah. Um, well, you might want to check out Will Trend because it's a great series. It is shot right here in Atlanta. Great cast. I feel like people are loving the show. Uh, so anyways, I'm in episode six. I play Reese Fox and I love it. CEO. Uh, you won't necessarily like me, but that's kind of um, And then look for Golden Influencer on Pure Flix uh, coming this spring. Um, I'm on kind of a, well, I'll leave that one out. Um, <laughs> and then I'm, I'm on Instagram as Deborah Stipe. I'm on TikTok having the time of my life. You know, one of the things that I really kind of want to say is that it's on Wikipedia. I'm 60, right? So I actually have a passion for letting anybody, but especially women, know that they're not done yet. I want women to know that. Um, I once was in a Bible study with Patty Heaton from Everybody Loves Raymond. And she has a great book out. It's called Your Second Act. And so each chapter is a woman's second act. This is a woman who later in life kind of figured out, uh, really kind of hit her stride and discovered something she's really passionate about and um, made it happen. So I kind of feel like it was funny during COVID, you know, we all got a little lazy during COVID. We don't have many, many options, right? So my son and I are talking and he says, mom, you know, they say that, they say that Donald Trump is obese. He said, and I said, obese, that's like such a harsh word. He mm -hmm. goes, I mean, obese, like we're not obese. And I, I, cause I was like, what is obese? And he's like, you and I, we're not obese. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're fluffy, but mm -hmm. we're not. And I remember thinking, huh, my son said I'm fluffy. How do I feel about that? Fluffy to me is like a nice word of saying you could lose a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. So I didn't even say anything to him. But inside I was like, I don't want to be fluffy. I want to be fit. And so I just, I feel like I'm at a season of my life where I'm just like, doggone it. This is my shot. Like, let's not dilly dally anymore. Let's get a little focused. Let's not be fluffy. Let's be fit. So I started getting more serious about my fitness because it helps my confidence and because I feel healthier. And because for me, I feel like it's a little bit my category. I tend to play women that are, you know, aging trophy wives or she once ran a pageant or, you know what I mean? I'm sort of in that category. And I think it's important for an actor to understand that about themselves. But the other thing I did is I just put myself in class and I have a great class. We meet via Zoom, but I feel like it's we're, we're actually connecting every Monday night great teacher. The actors are from LA or New York or from Atlanta. They're from everywhere. So I feel re-energized and I, I want people to hear that, especially women. Um, I have a passion for people to pursue their dreams and not to give up on themselves. So I bring that message just to you, but I also share it as I do a little bit of public speaking. Um, I share it on my social platforms. Um, because I want to inspire people. Yeah. And it's so funny you say, because uh, there's an entrepreneur on on the internet called Gary Vaynerchuk, AKA Gary V. And he talks about this all the time. He's like, you know, you know, you people get to a certain age and they're thinking, oh, it's over. But he's like, you're at halftime. He's like, you still got like 40 or 50 years to go. He's like, what are you doing? And it's just like, but it's, it's a mental thing too, but I, I love that. Yeah. Well, I mean, Jane Fonda, Betty White, there's some women that have had really fun, Helen Mirren, fun careers. That's what I kind of love about acting. I'm, and I'm okay to play the grandma. I'm okay with it. Well, I, 
Uh, I had the pleasure of interviewing Gary Marshall right two weeks before he passed. Guy was 94 and he was like, his phone was ringing during the interview. I'm like, dang, man, like somebody's trying to get a hold of you. He's like, they're always trying to call me. And he's like, I'm 94 and they keep telling me to stop and I'm not stopping. I'm like, <laughs> he's like, it's Julia Roberts. I'm like, what? I was like, get her on the phone. But no, I mean, he was, it's, yeah, he was still going too. So it was just, you know, you just, you got to have the passion, the drive and, you know, the mindset. And I totally understand with the whole quote unquote fluffy thing. I, I think everybody slipped into that. Cause I don't know. I ended up losing like 60 pounds myself. I do. Yeah. I went from 220 to 158, eight in six months. Like my, my sister came home she's like, are you sick? Like you could, I don't know if you've ever seen, um, the machinist from, um, uh, uh, who was a Christian Bale where it looks like he's a skeleton. Like you could see my face. So I've obviously started to bulk up now. I'm like at 185 or whatever, but I had lost a ton of weight too. And yeah, just by like walking, I mean, to break it down, lifting heavy, walking, uh, just focusing a lot on protein and tracking calories. But I kind of promote, I'm going to start promoting that in the program I'll be developing as well because it like, it was like the easiest 60 pounds I ever lost. Like it was, and I have done everything. <laughs> like, so it was just really cool. But I'm curious on how you, uh, or what worked for you. You know, I'm just about like trying to eat healthy. I kind of just really three things. I decided I'm not going to eat past 8 p.m. I'm going to work out, say, four times a week. I love to dance. That's my workout. So literally, I have a playlist of my favorite jams, and I play it in my basement. And I dance for 35 to 40 minutes nonstop. I have my little set routine. I mix it up sometimes. I add some new songs in there. And then I do a little core work and I call it a day. But for me, it's fun. It's a great outlet. It's great with coordination, energy. And uh, so that's really pretty pretty much it. And what's your number one workout dance jam? Oh, man. There's a song called Mercy by Buffy, which slays. But Michael Jackson is always, you know. Yeah. Charlie Puth, J Lo. I mean, I got it all. Yeah. yeah. yeah we'll definitely have to add that to the playlist. And uh, one last question Who's the better actress, you or your daughter? Oh, my God. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I just, I will say this. She surprises me because I taper a lot. Mm -hmm. Her comedy's always been strong. She could, that girl can cry on cue which I wouldn't have suspected, mm -hmm. but, um, she's funny. She's yeah. Funny. Kid, did you teach her how to cry on cue or did she do it? Did, did she do that on her own? I didn't. I mean, maybe she had seen me, like maybe she had taped me for some things, but, um, I don't recall teaching her that. And if she ever got in trouble, if your daughter ever got in trouble, do you know the difference between real tears and fake tears? <laughs> That's funny. Um, wow, the light just changed. Um, yes, I do. She's got some fake tears. <laughs> That's fake tantrums. I've seen them. <laughs> it's like, stop acting. That's where you're, you know, <laughs> 20 years in the industry. It's like, nah, nah. <laughs> That's so funny. All right. And uh, lastly, if you had to give anybody, you know, one last piece of advice for, or actually, you know what? No. If you had to create one more piece of content, like you could film something and put it online for everyone to see, what would be that one piece of content and why? That one piece of content would probably be, this may surprise you, be a portion of a hymn, a favorite hymn of mine. And it would be a gospel message. It would be because that matters the most to me. And that's the most important thing that I think I could leave behind um, is that I feel like God rescued me 
from myself. And I want that for others. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Deborah, where can we find you online? Uh, you can find me on Instagram. You can find me on TikTok if you're ready for just like a lot of fashion and fun. Um, and I'm on Facebook, but I really pop on there to tell you the truth. Um, and I also plug, um, we kind of my little wonderful side hustle is something called State of Lanaga. The Lanaga is an amazing town an hour north of Atlanta. And we have some amazing Airbnbs. We've got three tree houses, a really beautiful log cabin and some houses. Uh, we used to flip houses and then we bought this darling little house right on the square, right, right off the square of Dahlonega. And I said to my husband, who I don't usually say things like this to him, but I said, you know what? Let's try something new. This little business venture of Airbnb. Let's try it. So we did and we loved it. And so we've been doing it for, I don't know, seven years now. So Stay Dahlonega is on Instagram. We also have a website. If you think, where should I stay in Dahlonega? Stay Dahlonega. That's what you can look up and you'll find us. And we love what we do. We love affording, you know, offering hospitality to people everywhere. Awesome. Well, Deborah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's great sitting down with you, Thomas. Yep. Hope to run into you again at Costco sometime soon. Yeah. <laughs>